Hi, I'm Isabel Wong with Yahoo Finance, and joining us now is Michael Chan, co-founder and co-CEO of Bowtie. Michael is an actuary turned entrepreneur who co-founded Hong Kong's first virtual insurance company, Bowtie, back in 2018. Bowtie uses technology to simplify insurance experience and make different insurance products available online at a lower price. This year, the virtual insurer even opens a coffee shop as a physical venue for customers to talk to staff. In this conversation, we're going to find out from Michael about his vision for the future and where InsureTech will go in the road ahead. Great to have you here, Michael. Thank you for having me, Isabel. Now, first of all, I would like to talk about the, the challenges and opportunities for, for startups and entrepreneurs. Of course, mm -hmm. one of the biggest challenges we've seen, the world has seen, was the global pandemic. And, but also the pandemic has given us new perspectives in terms of how we used to think things would work and how they just completely stopped working yep. in the face of a global pandemic. So as an entrepreneur, what was the most important lesson you learned during the pandemic? It's a very good question, Isabel. Uh, I think one thing we always quote ourselves internally is that startups have a 90% chance of failing. So one of the biggest things we learned was really how to deal with even more uncertainty. So uh, as a startup, you don't know where the market is, you don't necessarily know what your product is, uh, you don't know how people will respond, you don't know how the incumbents will respond, and on top of all of that uncertainty, you now have how society changing, where would the future change, uh, healthcare is making big changes, public policy is making big changes. So all of that created a lot more uncertainty for I think all these startups out there. And we were definitely impacted as one of them, as a health company, as an insurance company. Uh, we have a social responsibility around delivering health insurance, around covering medical bills. So we were sort of on the front lines of, okay, how is this gonna play out? How do we position ourselves? So a lot of uh, decision under extreme uncertainty, I'd say. Right. And um, well, a follow up question is that, of course, um, during the pandemic, the first um, industry that would have yeah. to respond relatively quickly is the insurance industry. Yes. So how did Bowtie respond to the pandemic at the start of it all? Yeah, I still remember when it first started, no one had any idea what we were dealing with. Right. You know, is this airborne transmission? How, what how's are we going to have to quarantine everyone? What's going to happen? Is everything going to stop? Uh, for ourselves, we took a sort of two-step approach. One is make sure that our operations can keep running. So the very first thing we looked at, what if everything, what if everyone tomorrow had to work from home? You know, how does our claims work? How do our payment systems work? Do we have everything in place so that even if everyone were to be quarantined tomorrow, the company can still run? So we first had to make sure that the company is fine, we can still operate. The second one is actually look at, you know, how, uh, what are we responsible for? So what is our responsibility as an insurer? So looking back, you know, if there's a new pandemic, no one knows what it is. It's, it, we know it's a virus. We don't know how much it's going to cost to treat it. Uh, we don't necessarily, no one had any idea, you know, is it covered under insurance contracts, under all the different insurance products, how is it covered? Uh, a lot of fact finding, a lot of uh, making decisions. Okay, we're going to cover this. We are going to cover this. Both high covers COVID-19 treatments. Uh, if you're quarantined, we pay you additional money to cover the, your lost income, your lost expenses, et cetera. So a lot of those, what is our core responsibility and what we should we be doing, even in the face of something completely new? Well, of course, during the pandemic, we have also seen the surge um, in demand in mm. terms of virtual products and services, yeah. namely virtual banking, insurance or telehealth. So um, what do you think will be some of the products and areas that will still continue yeah. to, 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 um, to gain traction yeah. even after the pandemic? Yeah, I think one immediate thing we saw was a lot more interest in health content on online. Uh, just the health awareness, the, the search for health information just exploded. So for our, our own website, for example, uh, Bowtie does actually put out quite a lot of health content as a health insurer. We use that as a traffic funnel. We use that to be helpful. Uh, Pre-pandemic, our website used to get about 200,000 uh, traffic visitors a month. During the, the height of the pandemic, we were getting over 2 million, so a 10 times increase. And this is with a Hong Kong population of about 7 million people. Uh, the other one that I think is much more interesting, um, and it's actually something that Bowtie has done also, is people are much more aware of the preventative health side. So it's tied to the increase in health awareness. So now that everyone's so health aware, it, we've, we've seen that actually treatment doesn't make sense. So you're not going to build enough hospitals. You're not, not going to have enough hospital beds for everyone if you just let this run. How can everyone keep better health? How can everyone, everyone keep better conditioning? So that's actually one of the, the drivers for Bowtie to actually open up our own health clinic. Even if you're not ill, are there things we can change about your behavior? Are there things we can better monitor you? 
around. And there's a lot of interesting health technology that's emerging that we're putting into the clinic. So I think that, that awareness, I think it's just a general increase in health awareness, is driving a lot more demand for data as well as just preventative health. How can I keep myself healthier? And now that you speak of um, data, so um, how do you envision um, mm. consumer behavior will continue to evolve? What are some of the questions that you get the most from your customers? Fundamentally, the, I think the big issue is there's a lot of friction between how data flows. So as an insurer, we, we digitize a lot of our processes. You know, our, our underwriting is digitized, our claims are digitized. But at a certain point, the moment we touch the health system, a lot of things still go back to a much slower offline. We literally still stand faxes unfortunately, um, to request information from some healthcare providers because that's the only protocol, that's the only available channel to accept requests. So until we can digitize you know, a, a general rise in other industries, uh, there will be a lot of our pieces that consumers expect us to be digitized, but unfortunately we need to move the entire, entire society and other industries up before we can move there. Now, moving on to your vision, so of mm. course, um, in, in the past few years, or even in the digital age, we saw how soon um, technologies such as AI, blockchain, and Internet of Things changed the way many industries operate, yep. or even the creation of new sectors. So as an entrepreneur who operates in the digital economy, how do you, uh, what's your vision for the future, basically? Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I I see, I think the fundamental biggest change I want to see is actually, uh, there's a very old adage in the insurance industry, which is that insurance is sold and not bought. So insurance is historically understandable. You don't want to talk about death. You don't want to talk about illnesses. So you require someone to come sell you it effectively. And because of such a pushy sales process, that downstream creates a lot of problems at the industry that regulators have to deal with. We think a lot of that root problem comes from that initial pushing sales process. And I think a lot of what we're trying to do on the digital side is actually how do you reverse that? How do you get consumers to be, to be known or to be responsible for, okay, I know I should get health insurance. People have that awareness, so okay, I'm traveling, I should get travel insurance. But we don't necessarily have that yet for life and health insurance. So when we can get that, that behavioral change through technology, through making the products much more simpler, through information being much more transparently available, once we make it that easy, I believe we can start changing that equation, which is we don't have to be pushing insurance onto people. And people can accept it as part of, you know, a lot of their other finances. Payments, for example, is very, very digitized nowadays. Uh, people want that. They see the convenience. They see the benefit of that. I think insurance is still in the very early stage of that. So in Hong Kong, less than 1% of insurance is distributed online. Uh, but it's growing extremely fast. So last year, Bowtie grew 10 times. Uh, we have quite a few peers also working on the digital insurance side. They've all grown very fast. So we're starting to see that pick up, but I think the vision is still, how do we change that so not bought mentality? So this year, we, you don't just operate in the digital space because you decided to open a coffee shop. And um, could you please walk us through the thinking behind that decision and how successful has it been for you guys? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a very fun process, first of all. Uh, there's two reasons why we did the coffee shop. The first is, uh, we were talking about insurance is so not bought, I want to be able to change that. So we don't have uh, pushy sales, but we do want to be helpful. We do want to be there for customers when you need us. And so the coffee shop is largely a symbolic meaning. It's a physical location where customers can always trust that you go there, you'll be able to find both high. Someone will help you. So it's really that being helpful mentality being put into a very physical manifestation. The second reason we did the coffee shop was actually uh, our lease came up in the middle of the pandemic. And there was a lot of questions around what's going to happen afterwards. Are we going to work, work from home? Are we going to go distributed remote? Are we going to all come back to the office? You know, how are we going to change? How is the, the mode of working going to change after the pandemic? And again, it was one of those things we don't know how it's going to play out yet. I think a lot of companies are still trying to figure out the right balance. Uh, we decided we'd go remote first. So it'd be optional to come to the office and we've kept that policy since. But we do want people to come into the office and have a, a room to collaborate, to discuss, to, to socialize. And that's really where a lot of the creativity comes from. And um, as you mentioned earlier, there, there are more insurance players mm. um, entering the space. It's getting more crowded. So um, in, in that sense, what direction do you think insure tech will take in the road ahead? Um, or, or what kind of customer pain points yep. will the industry address other than just speed and access? Yeah. I think speed and access is still going to be the focus for a lot of people for a long time. 
uh, the insurance purchase process is still extremely long. It's still extremely unfriendly and not very convenient, frankly. So there's still a lot of work to be done. I don't, I don't want to downplay that. I think moving ahead, there's going to be a lot more financial education that we have to do. I think we'll be successful when the general financial literacy level is raised. So it depends on us to actually raise the level of, for example, in Hong Kong, a lot of people don't know how much life insurance they need. If you were to ask you know, any, any person on the street, I, I like to ask some of our customers, how did you decide to buy you know, this much life insurance? And actually the answer is surprisingly often, they read some of our blog articles, they read some of our calculators, and we actually gave them that information so that they had the confidence to know how much life insurance they should buy. And that, that number is generally not well known. Uh, recently the insurance authority released their own calculator to help people come to terms with that number. Uh, another an question I like to ask, I heard from another CEO, is he likes to ask his staff, if you were to delay retirement by five years, how would that impact your, your retirement spending? How much more money would you have? How much more money could you spend every month after retirement? Or what if you were to retire five years earlier? How would that change? And practically no one, even in the insurance industry, can answer that question. So there's a lot of basic financial literacy things that you know, I think it's really the, the industry's responsibility, the regulator's responsibility to help promote. Right, and in, in terms of the future market landscape, I would like to ask, um, what, what do you think that's going to look like, um, the market dynamics? Do you mm. see more consolidation, or do you see the coexistence between virtual and traditional players? I think it will be, m my own guess, uh, it's anyone's guess, will be a lot of coexistence. Uh, there will be certain segments that will want a uh, pressureless sales environment. I can just go online, look at what I need to know, uh, and then just easily buy what I need to buy, and then have the trust that the customer service will be there when they need it. There will be a portion of customers that are less comfortable with the whole process. Uh, they just don't want to deal with financials. They need some nudging. And those people will probably go back to the traditional advisor channels. So I think we'll see both. I, I think it's quite similar to how e-commerce and physical commerce, uh, both will still happen. Uh, there will be certain segments and certain use cases for, for the different channels. And um, finally, what's next for Bowtie? Any new products, international expansion? Where do you see opportunities? Yeah, uh, in international expansion is definitely in the cards. We're, we're talking to many parties there. Uh, we're going a lot more into health, actually. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we opened up our own clinic. Uh, we have a partner with Glen Eagles Hospital in Hong Kong. It was one of the first products to actually be co-branded between an insurance company and a hospital um, to fully cover sort of package plans, et cetera. But the, the key there is, I think, uh, actually a, a mentor was mentioning, insurers used to be very early adopters of insurance. So when computers first came out, insurers bought, were the first adopters. They paid a lot. They helped invest a lot into computers to help commercialize them because we're such uh, greedy users of technology. And I think that's slowly changed. We've slowly become a much more, almost a dinosaur industry. We're very slow to adopt technology. And so we're bringing in a lot of new technology, we're injecting a lot of new technology, and what I'm looking at next is there's some really exciting things happening on the health side, on the biotech side. Uh, the, the pace of development, the, the money pouring into that has been amazing. And insurers are still very, very slow to adopt a lot of the innovations happening there. So I, I want Bowtie to be one of those that can actually be early adopters, that can help fund and invest into a lot of health innovations and actually find use cases for them and actually help bring them to commercialization. So we'll be investing a lot more into the healthcare space in the future. Well, thank you for the conversation, Michael. That was Michael Chan, co-founder and co-CEO of Bowtie.